Before we move into the heart of chapter 11, we need to spend a few pages thinking a little bit about some material from chapter one, in particular the design of experiments. So let's talk about something we already learned about in chapter four, which was section 1.2. The difference between an observational study and a designed experiment is a very, very important distinction to understand. It's what allows us to say correlation is not causation, things like that. So an observational study measures the value of the response variable without attempting to influence the value of either the response or the explanatory variable. That is, in an observational study, the researcher observes the behavior of individuals without trying to influence the outcome of the study. Surveys, by the way, would fall into this when you just call people up and ask them questions. A design experiment is a controlled study in which the researcher attempts to understand cause and effect relationships. The study is controlled in the sense that the researcher controls how subjects are assigned to the groups and which treatment each group receives. In the analysis phase of either a study or an experiment, the researcher compares group scores to some on some response variables. So when you do a study or an experiment, you compare, you know, this group to this group, this group to this group. The difference is that in an observational study, because the researchers didn't get to choose who was in which group, the researcher can only draw a conclusion about whether the predictor variable has a relationship with the response variable. Whereas in a design experiment, the researcher can start drawing conclusions about whether or not the predictor variable causes the dependent variable change, has a causal effect. Causal effect meaning it causes some change. All right, so let's explain whether each of the following is an observational study or a designed experiment. Researchers want to study the effect of a new treatment for high blood pressure. They gather 1,000 people with hypertension and place 500 randomly in a group to receive the new drug and 500 randomly in a group um, that will receive the standard old drug. Notice there's no placebo here. They don't give nothing to these people, right? They give them either the new drug or the old drug, but you have to give people with hypertension something or they're going to have heart attacks. After two months, the blood pressure of each person is measured and those on the new drug are found to have a significantly lower blood pressure than those on the standard drug. Well, that is very much an experiment. It's an experiment because the researcher is administering, the researchers are administering the treatment and randomly selecting the P subjects for each group, right? In other words, the researcher chose which person got to be in the new drug group and which person got to be in the old person, old drug group. And one of the key words is randomly. They are randomly selecting who gets to be in what. That's the researcher in control. That's an experiment. Now, if the researcher wants to study the effect of air pollution on lung capacity, they gather 500 random people that live in highly polluted cities and measure their lung capacity. They then gather 500 random people that live in low pollution rural areas and measure their lung capacity. It is found that the people in the low pollution areas have greater lung capacity. In other words, you can breathe deeper, you can breathe more fully if you live in a rural area than you can if you live in a city. Well, that's an observational study. They're measuring things. They're measuring the lungs capacity. So they're having these people breathe into machines. However, the researchers did not randomly select who was in what environment. The people chose what environment they were going to be in. And therefore, you can't make a causal effect. You can't say pollution causes low lung capacity. All you can say is that pollution and lung capacity have a relationship. There, I just kind of added this as a note. So note, because this is an observational study, we can only make an argument that pollution and lung capacity are related, but we can't make a cause effect argument. Whereas because this one was an experiment, we could make an argument that the new drug perhaps, now we're never 100% sure, but perhaps causes lower blood pressure. Right? Very different worlds in the arguments that you can make from an experiment to an observational study. Now we already breezed by a couple definitions up here of um, response and predictor, response and predictor variable, dependent variable, things like that. So let's refine those definitions again. We already saw these in chapter four with section 1.2, but we'll see them again. So an explanatory variable is a characteristic intended to explain the differences in the response variable. And one of the keys to that is it's a characteristic. Don't be too sp specific with it. It's kind of a general thing. And then the treatment is an explanatory variable that takes the form of a purposeful intervention in a designed experiment. So often can treatment is a combination of many factors. So you'll do things like have them exercise more and have them take the new drug and whatever. Those are treatments. 
response variable is an out, uh, outcome of the subjects brought about by the differences in the predictor variable or treatment. So lung capacity, things like that. That's a response variable because it's what you're trying to see an effect in. So you, you play around with explanatory variables. So this gets manipulated, um, manipulated, well actually treatments in particular are manipulated by the researcher. Oh, and I don't even have to really type it. It's kind of in this word, purposeful intervention. That means the, the researcher is manipulating what's going on. All right, confounding is when you have, there are other things that could be affecting what's going on. So when experimental controls do not allow the experimenter to reasonably eliminate plausible alternative explanations for an obs observed relationship between the explanatory and response variables. So in other words, there's a third thing that's happening that's affecting both your explanatory and response. So it's um, another item that isn't in your original data set, isn't something you considered, but it's affecting what your results are. It's kind of like the noise in the data. A lurking variable is one of the specific variables that is an explanatory variable that is affecting what's going on and it's not was not part of your original study. An experimental unit is a subject or person or some other well-defined item upon which a treatment is implied. So you are experimenting on them. They are your subject if you are the researcher. It means you actually manipulated them, put them into a group, gave them a treatment, that kind of thing. Now the placebo, I talked about it just a minute ago, it's a neutral treatment. It has no effect, so like a sugar pill, that kind of thing, um, or just nothing. They'll do like fake acupuncture and real acupuncture and people and test whether they have a difference. So it's a placebo, meaning nothing was done. Now that's different than back here. For this one, they actually gave the other people a drug. They just gave them the standard drug. Sometimes it's unethical to give people nothing. So sometimes you're comparing treatments against each other. Sometimes you're comparing treatments against a placebo. Sometimes you're comparing treatments and another treatment and a placebo all at the same time. It happens. Now the placebo effect is when subjects respond differently after they receive a treatment, even if the treatment was a placebo. So people that feel better even though they got a sugar pill, right? It's, it's a common sitcom uh, plot line. Actually, I can think of it in some more drama movies, right? With doctors that gave out placebos. Oh, you know, it was a big thing in the 50s that they would talk about this. All right, so a control group is the baseline group that receives no treatment or a neutral treatment. To assess treatment effects, the experimenter group, um, the experimenter group to results in the control group. And that's not a sentence. Let me read it again. The experimental control group is compared. There we go. We got to need a verb in there. Compared to results in the control group. So again, think of this one back here. The control group was actually the one that was receiving this old um, drug. This particular one didn't actually have a control group. High pollution, low pollution, um, they're kind of compared against each other. I mean, you could make an argument, maybe the low pollution's the, the control group, but since you didn't really have any control on that data set anyway, you weren't giving out any treatments. The people just chose their own. There really is no control in this particular study. This one had a, a control group and it's the old drug. Old drug is your control group right there. All right, now blinding is um, non-disclosure. They don't pull people's eyes out. That's not what blinding means. <laughs> blinding means um, you don't know what you're getting. So for a single blind study, that means that the unit, the experimental unit does not know what treatment they're receiving. So for example, for the fake acupuncture, you go in, you think you're getting real acupuncture and they basically have these little fake needles that seem like they're sticking into your skin, but they're not, they're kind of with an adhesive. So you think you're getting it, but you're actually not. That's a single blind experiment because the person doing it knows that they're giving you a needle or not. A double blind experiment is when neither the, the experimental unit, the person getting the treatment, nor the researcher knows which group they're in. That's a good thing because um, you don't want them to bias the results. Now you can't always do it. Like for example, in the case of the fake acupuncture, you can't do it. They know what they're, they're, what they're giving you. But if it's like a pill, the person might be able to make a placebo look just like a regular pill and then they know what they're doing because they'll have you numbered. Like you'll say, you're number five, here's the cup you get. And somebody behind the screens knows what that person is, but the person that's giving the drug and asking the questions doesn't. And that's a really good thing because it, it eliminates bias on both the part of the researchers and the part of the person taking the pill. Just be careful. Um, in general, a control group does not automatically mean that a study has an experiment. For example, oh, see, we could refer to a uh, researcher compares the lung cancer rates and records of 150 non-smokers and 150 smokers. 
So you have a control group. The control group is the non-smokers. Those are the people that are have your baseline treatment of nothing. But it's observational, even though it's a control group. You're not going to force people to smoke. So you can't make an experiment out of it. But it still has this control group of the non-smokers. They're the control group. Matter of fact, let me highlight that. They are the control group right there. So again, with the researchers wanting to study high blood pressure, so they gather a 1,000 people with hypertension, that's high blood pressure, and place 500 in a group to receive the new drug and 500 in the group to receive the standard old drug. After two months, the blood pressure of each person is measured and those on the new drug are found to have significantly lower blood pressure than those on the standard drug. So your explanatory variable is your treatment, which is your hypertension drug. Right? And now there's two different treatments here. There's the new drug and the old drug. So there's two levels, the new and the old. Right? Sometimes you'll have studies that have three levels. They'll have two new ones and an old one, or a placebo and a new one and an old one, things like that. The response variable is the blood pressure. That's the thing that they're measuring. So they're trying to measure. See this? After two months, the blood pressure is measured. See that? That means that that is your response variable. It's what you're measuring about these people after you've given them the treatment. Now, the experimental units would be all 1,000 people in the study, every last one of them. They're the experimental units. They're the ones that you are manipulating into their groups and so on. The control group is the 500 people that receive the old drug, the 500 randomly that's received the old drug right there. That's your control group. There we have it. Now, if this study was double blind, what would that imply? Well, to make it double blind, it means that the person who gets the drug doesn't know what they're getting, and the person who's giving them the drug doesn't know exactly what they're giving. Now, somebody knows somewhere because, of course, you can't just give people random pills, but what happens is they basically say, they number off all the patients, and they say, person number 22 gets this, and then they don't know what they're giving them. They just know that it's a pill. So you're saying, there, it's a blue pill. Take this blue pill. They don't know if it's, if it's the old drug or the new drug. There, I just typed that up. So the subject getting the drug does not know if they're getting the old drug or the new drug. Also, the person who works directly with that subject does not know if they're giving or giving giving the old or the new drug. Now, somebody knows somewhere, but not the person who works directly with that subject, right? The person who works directly with them also doesn't know. That will make your results have less bias and be more reliable.